Welcome to the Mudise Network. The governor of the Reserve Bank, Lesecha Kanyaho, has been in this role for more than five years. And his pronouncements on interest rates are eagerly awaited and observed by key role players in the economy. Together with his colleagues, they manage the monetary policy of South Africa and work closely with international institutions to keep our currency stable and inflation rates under control. They do so by analyzing the behavior of our domestic, regional and global economies. The governor has been working in the economic management space for decades and is a highly respected official around the world. He's also better placed to assess and comment on the state of our economy. He's joining me now to share his thoughts on the factors that are likely to help grow the economy or pose risks to our system. Well, thank you very much, uh, Governor, for giving us your time, and we will have an extended time this time to reflect on the state of the South African economy. Various concerns out there. There's the SAA strike going on, there's talk of Moody's uh, downgrading South Africa, and um, everybody's on the edge these days when it comes to the economy. What is your own overview of the state of affairs? The economy is not in a, in a very good space. Um, we expect the economy to only grow by 0.5% uh, uh, this year. Um, what has been happening here is that uh, for the past five years at least, this economy has been growing slower than the rate of population growth, which means that on a per capita basis, we are becoming poorer uh, as a nation. That's the first point. The second point is that the global economy itself is slowing down, it's not in a good space, but South Africa has been growing slower than the global economy and slower than our emerging market peers uh, for, the past, uh, for the past five years. Clearly, our problem can't be that it is the global economy. We have got our own idiosyncrasies. And what are those idiosyncrasies? Um, those idiosyncrasies, I'll split them into both structural or supply side measures and uh, the demand uh, uh, the demand side on the structural side we had identified what the constraints to growth in this economy uh, are we have put plan after plan the problem has not been that we do not figure out what must be done is that after we had figured out what must be done we just do not do it and whether it is the restructuring of the uh, energy sector, whether it is the uh, release of broadband, you can go on and on, and these things are once again captured in the National Treasury's uh, paper, which, once again, very good South Africans, we are discussing it. And those are the structural, uh, the structural issues. And then people then would look and then say that, well, then something else could be done on the demand side. And on the demand side, really, you have got fiscal policy and monetary policy. And those are the two policies that uh, have got a big impact on, uh, on demand. But when people analyze these things, they look at the today and they must see how we have evolved. The truth of the matter is that fiscal policy have been injecting massive resources into this economy since 2008 after the global financial uh, crisis. Monetary policy had injected in a lot of stimulus since that period. And actually, at some stage, our policy rates were as low as 5%, even below the inflation rate that we are having. That in itself had provided massive, uh, massive stimulus. But those stimulus leaked. How did it leak? It leaked because you had structural constraints. And because you have got structural constraints, that stimulus has got to source things from uh, elsewhere. And people might start a debate and say that we must produce these things ourselves. But the point is that if people have got the demand for this month or for next week or for uh, this year, sorting out your production to do all of those things is going to take time. And the result is that they will import uh, from elsewhere. And the result had been that for a long time. 
we ended up running a trade, a, a trade deficit. That trade deficit had to be financed. And how we finance it, we finance it through attracting foreign savings. And so foreigners were quite happy to fund uh, our trade and current account deficit. They were quite happy to fund our budget deficit because we said we were providing a stimulus. The thing here is that if you are borrowing money, you've got to invest the money in things that generate income so that you are able to repay the money uh, in the future. And, um, and uh, these foreigners who have lent us money, they must be paid. And as they are being paid, this gets reflected in the current account, uh, in the current account deficit. So as people talk today of further fiscal stimulus, and we must have two monetary stimulus, they have got to understand that there had been fiscal and monetary stimulus since 2008. And the point is, 11 years on, what do we have to show for it? Mm. And now we are faced with this situation where we are now, these constraints are starting to be binding. And unless we address them, we will not be able to lift this. I want to go back to the uh, earlier point you made. You said we've got all the policies we need. We've thought these things through and policies get formulated. The information that everybody needs is publicly available. Mm -hmm. Stats SA tells us now and again how the economy is doing and breaks it down into the different sectors. It tells us about what's happening with the uh, labor market. And so it goes. Now, question is, what is stopping the very people who formulate these policies from implementing them? From where you're sitting, what do you think stops the ability and willingness to implement? The thing about what we end up having to do in the central bank is that we have got a very clear task and the things that we say we are going to do, we do. On the fiscal and social policy stuff, in any society there will always be a political contestation. And if there is a contestation in society, the state has always been the countervailing force on behalf of the voiceless and the poor. To stop an, an ever-going contestation that does not deliver, uh, deliver uh, the goods. And if there is that contestation, the state has got to be the moderator in this contestation and eventually uh, make the decisions. And I guess that is how far I can take it because it is it's all that it means. Well, but, but it governor, is in the political. And, I, and, and I understand where, where you're coming from. But then there are immediate, glaring, obvious situations that emerge in our society that do indicate that something has got to give, something has got to happen. Let's take unemployment, for instance, right? It's there. And uh, it's something that impacts the lives of individuals and families, and by extension, communities. So as people are trying to figure themselves out on whether to do, implement, or not implement, certainly <laughs> members of this society, citizens in this country, would like to see an impact on at least uh, the employment situation, as an example. Yes, and they are right to uh, want to see that. But I'd like to take this thing so that people uh, understand this. You cannot beat an economy that is weak or on its knees and force it to create jobs. It won't. Jobs are an outcome of economic activity. There is no economy I know that creates jobs and is not growing. There might be an economy somewhere, I don't know where, that doesn't grow, uh, that grows and doesn't create jobs. But I can't think of one that creates jobs and is not, is not growing. Mm. And when you look at our economic trajectory uh, since uh, about 2010, you see a declining growth rate. And we had had two recessions over the past 11 years. And what that tells you is 
job creation in this economy slows down. Why? Because jobs are an outcome of economic growth. So if we have to deal with the unemployment situation, if anybody says, no, 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 forget growth, let's just create jobs, they just do not understand how a modern economy functions because jobs come out of economic activity. So necessarily, our focus should then be on getting growth in this economy uh, going. But, but let, me, let me just come in there, because there was a time in South Africa where the talk was uh, because of the cyclical nature of things, especially in mining, for instance, that we have to have infrastructure-led uh, stimulation in the economy, right? Where we had the strategic uh, infrastructure programs and projects that were put in place. And lots of money was being mentioned at the time. I go back to the mid 2000s, so I think 2006, seven, thereabouts, talk was this 800 billion runs available 887 to be exact. 887 right that is going to be pumped into the economy and this is how south africa is just going to continue on that uh, on that path and of course 2008 uh, financial meltdown happened and then somehow things disappeared into now, the 887 billion was announced uh, in uh, 2008 in the in the budget policy state. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was our response to the global financial crisis. Yes, yes. It was our response to the global financial crisis. But, but even then, I mean, uh, there were a lot of infrastructure projects that one, oh, no. one could see well, anyway. Well, uh, not only that. Yeah. Uh, the truth of them, the Treasury was running a book and it had these projects on uh, the book. Uh, I'm no longer in the uh, yeah. uh, Treasury. But I just wish that somebody could just ask the question. In November 2008, we said we are going to spend 887 billion rands uh, in this economy. At that time, we were talking of an about 2 trillion rand economy. That spending was massive. It was about, uh, about almost 50% 40, 40, 40, 40, 50 yeah, of, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, of GDP. Yeah. Uh, yes, understandably, it was over a, a five-year period uh, uh, or so. Somebody needs to go back and say, wait, where did we spend that money? What happened to these projects? What were the impact of these projects on uh, alleviating the structural constraints? What had been the impact of these projects on creation of jobs and so forth? You've got to be asking, uh, without picking up on in any industry, some of the sectors spend the massive amounts of money and we are still having the same constraints that we were having uh, before the money was spent. Well, and that's why I'm asking the question, because I'm one of those people that have been thinking about this, that we were told this, this amount of money that's going to be invested and it's going to unlock uh, so many opportunities and, of course, enhance the infrastructure in the country. I think that there was a lot done. There was even talk, there was a creation of presidential infrastructure investment uh, council and all of this. I think that, uh, Bratim, if you were to have a conversation uh, with those structures, we, you, might, you will get a better answer than you'll get from a central bank. <laughs> but, but, but I'm asking the question, and I, again, I do understand why, why where you're sitting, you wouldn't want to move in that direction. But it's uh, like a task you're giving me now, yeah, uh, that I should go well, and ask those questions. Yes, uh, it, is, uh, uh, it is a task. I, and, because we've got to ask it. We've got yes. to ask that question. And it's correct to ask that question. We'll look at other points in the economy, other factors and, and developments in our economy, the constraints, the risks, as well as the potential of the economy to grow as we continue our conversation with the governor of the Reserve Bank, Mr. Lisecha Kanyahu.